the success. And just let them know where you're from and what you study. 90 seconds. So they're about success. That you don't know. That you don't know. Thirty seconds. Fifteen seconds. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five. You know, this seems like some of the favorite part of some of your my experience. Now, I did yesterday, I'm telling you, I did sit with a couple who met that they were married and they did meet each other at, at uh, RUI. And so that was really, really cool to see that. They're pioneering new campus ministry. It's a great thing. I mentioned in my story, I was, uh, my mom died when I was eight. I didn't tell you this other part. It also, when I was eight years old, I was kidnapped. I'm just thinking it at that. Hey, guys, let me tell you this. <laughs> God did not commission you, and God did not call you to just learn how to run a good meeting. Now, you think about this. What kind of meeting did Jesus run? What were the topics of the meetings that he ran? So I want to suggest you, you're not called in this, you're not commissioned to run a good meeting. God did not call you. He did not commission you to be a great event planner. Although you may learn to run a good meeting, you may learn event planning. But that's not what, what he commissioned you to. That's not what he called you to, to be an event planner. God did not call you to performance. And this light of the glorious gospel is not a spotlight for man to stand under. Rather, the light of the glorious gospel is a light that you shine to others, that illuminates Christ, so that they know and they see him through you. We have a great commission by our Lord. If we're going to fulfill his commission, it's going to require you and I being full of his spirit and walking in authentic kingdom authority. Matthew 28, 18 through 20. We're familiar with this passage, but I want to exegete it with us this morning. It says this. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. But hold on with you always to the end of the age. And I believe today we're going to dissect some things that are critical critical for us and what God wants to do in us and through us. So the first thing is this. Jesus said, all authority. How much authority? All. Say it again. How much? Oh. All authority. Okay, that word in the Greek is the word pas. And what that means is everything that was, everything that is, and everything that is to come. In other words, it's past, present, and future. All right, so that word in the Greek pas. Everything that was, is, is to come, past, present, future. All authority in where? Say it. Heaven and earth. Say it again. Heaven and on earth. All right? In the cosmos, here in the world that you live in. In other words, what Jesus is saying is this. Everything that you know and everything you don't know. Everything that was, that is, and is to come. All of it 
from the heavenlies to the terrestrial is under my authority. So there's absolutely nothing, Jesus says, that is not under his authority. That word authority means the domain of his rule. All right? Everything is under his authority. Heaven and earth. It's been given to him. And then he says, go therefore. Well, that go therefore, which just translate to what it really means today, is because of this, go. All right? So that's what it means. Because of this, you go. Make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, teaching them to serve all that I've commanded you. Now, when we hear our great missions messages, and even in our Chi Alpha missions model, every student goes, gives, prays, every student welcomes, every student feeds a child, right? Feeds one, feed one. When we hear these things, oftentimes we think that our primary verb of Jesus' great commission is to go. That we are to go to all the nations. People come to our churches and they will preach go. But the primary verb in here, which many of you know, is not go. The primary verb is to make. And the three other verbs in here are subordinate to the primary verb of to make. And we are called. So the great commission is not to go into all the nations. Boy, that just blew a lot of people's theology. The Great Commission is not to go into all the nations. The Great Commission is to make disciples of all ethnic groups of all peoples. That is the Great Commission. It's to make disciples of all nations. Okay? And we do so by three things that are subordinate to make. We do so by baptizing by teaching, and by going. So those things are all subordinate. They are all predicated upon making disciples. And he says, and behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. As a said, I've completed my first book, Kingdom Authority. I'm going to begin to dissect some things here out of this passage that will help you really get an understanding, I believe, of what Holy Spirit and what Jesus intended when he said, all authority in heaven and has been given me because of this you go. Because of this authority that I have, you go, you walk in the same authority. Well, I talked about when Jesus had meetings. I wonder what kind of meetings his were. You're not called to sit down and be a little critiquer of everybody's messages and stuff. Jesus, after he preached it, Hey, hey, guys, come here. Hey, how do you think I did up on the sermon on the mount? How's my sermon on the mount? What do you think? Give me a critique of the, of my introduction. What do you think? When he sent his disciples out, what did he send them to do? You think about this contextually. When Jesus sent his disciples out, what did he send them to do? Take them in there. You know, if you can pull together a really good party, you'll probably attract a bunch of people. And then you know, you're going to meet those. No, you think about what he sent them out there to do. Now, there's some stuff I'm going to share today that will sound countercultural to who we are in Kai Alpha. We hold events because it's important that we find them. We want to run really good meetings, we want to be excellent communicators. But if you are relying on the arm of your flesh, you will never, ever fulfill the fullness of the purpose of the kingdom of God. It will not happen. So, my first book is out. It should be, we're praying it's printed in time for CMC. Kingdom authority. Kingdom authority defined and its components. Um, thankful to BGMC and Life for the Law, they've given us the funds to be able to put one in every one of your hands. And so if you are not at CMC, um, we will work to get one sent to you so that you have it. Like it's critical that every tie out for this block to understand it. So let me define when I say kingdom authority what I mean. Okay. Kingdom authority, acting in the fullness of biblical and Holy Spirit provision. Okay, so kingdom authority, acting in the fullness of biblical and Holy Spirit.
English for provision. Now, I want to remind you today, what I started reaching you with is this. You're no longer students. You're missionaries. And you're Chi Alpha missionaries. And therefore, we're going to speak to you and treat you and address you with the maturity of what we expect out of a Chi Alpha missionary. So I'm going to say some things today. They're going to be honest. They're going to be direct. Some of them may be raw. Um, but you've got to keep your, your head, your spirit in the right, right position to be able to receive this stuff. So act in the fullness of biblical and Holy Spirit provision, kingdom authority. Now, there are four quadrants of kingdom authority that I'm going to talk about and begin to unpack with you here. Well, let me start with a little story. I was 23 years old, about the age of you guys. I was in my first year of being the campus pastor at the University of Arizona, a pioneer missionary at the U of A. Went in there with a lot of faith, a lot of vision. Nobody ever told me, Scott, you need to raise a full budget. Scott, you need to go get uh, get a team. I went in there just when people said, man, if you're called, you go for it. The Lord will provide. You don't need to raise a budget. If you're walking by faith, you will provide everything I need of, okay? I'm just leaving that there, too. But I quickly learned um, to rely on Jesus for everything that we were doing. Everything I was doing. 23 years old. I get a call from my home church in Arizona. The little church that I grew up in. I get sent for the people. They're without a pastor. It's April of that year. So I'm coming to the end of my first year of ministry. It's just me on campus. They call up and say, Scott, that pastor rotating different people, would you be willing to come and speak Sunday morning at the church? I'd love to. Man, I'm going home, going to the home church. So that next Sunday morning, I come and pull me out. Get up, get out, and I'm greeted by people. Hey, he's got something. Man, he should have been here last week. Really? Yeah. Oh, man, there's a man so and so is preaching here, and there's a powerful move of God. And Buddy up there was just, and this is a direct quote. He was up at the altar doing a Pentecostal chant. Direct quote. Yeah, that makes you feel really good when you're speaking now. You know, when you're speaking, they go, you should have been your last week. It was so powerful. <laughs> the level of expectation was a little happens in your hometown, your family, and village. So I get that, and I really prepared well, man. I felt like I had a great message. I got up that Sunday morning to speak, deliver the word, give an altar call, and nothing. Just nothing. No response. People just sit there ready to go get through lunch. We get done. I go back to the farm, and I'm content. So I'm just wanting to go back to campus. I had to speak that night. That was when you did Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night church back in the day. It was Sunday night service that night. So I had one more time. Like, Jesus, what do you want me to say to him? I, 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 I don't have it. It's obvious I don't have anything for him. I said, well, I'll do whatever you ask. And I'm surrendering you, so I'll do whatever you ask. Holy Spirit, just speak to me and say, Scott, you don't have to preach anything. Just read Ephesians chapter 6. Just get up and read Ephesians chapter 6. So that night, I get up, they have their song service. So I like everyone to open up with me to Ephesians chapter 6, and I begin to read Ephesians chapter 6 to the church. As I am, this buddy who had did the Pentecostal chair, you know, the Sunday before, he sit in the front row. Now, I want you to picture this church. Very small, you know, maybe 60 chairs in the whole thing, and they would hook, there were plastic chairs that were connected together. Yeah. He's sitting up in the front row. But he gets up on, I'm reading Ephesians chapter 6, and starts moving to the back. Well, I thought he had to use a restroom. Well, my dad's sitting in the back of the church. My dad's not real demonstrative in church. Well, my dad's a man man. Okay, he was a tough guy. Buddy, you my dad, love my dad, go out to the farm. All of a sudden, why I'm reading, so I'm focused on sex reading. All of a sudden, I hear my dad let out this blood curdling scream. So it would be like if right now somebody all of a sudden just scream, screech and scream. Scott, get back here! Well, I'm up front, and there's this oak rostrum that's probably 200 pounds that's behind me. I'm like, oh my gosh, my first thought is my dad's having a heart attack or a stroke. Then I turn to everyone, you know, the 50 people in there, I'm like, what's going on, man? I go running up there to my dad, and I, I looked at him, and I saw something in him that I had never seen before in my life. Fear. Then I looked at my dad, and there was fear in his eyes. And he mouthed to me, Help me. And I looked down, and Buddy, who a week before had done the little Pentecostal jig up the altar, 
is down on his knees, has hold of my dad in a vice grip around the stomach. Just grip my dad. Growling, foaming at the mouth, and his eyes glazed over. Now, I'm 23 years old, and I had just recently sat in the same seat you guys are in. And let me tell you what, nobody at you ever taught me how to deal with this. This wasn't something we were teaching in our CMITs. All of a sudden, I'm dealing, there is a cataclysmic clash between kingdoms right here. The kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of God. Like, there will, man, the only training I had received in spiritual warfare. The only time I had was when I was eight years old, the first church I went into, and there were two old ladies who came up to me. Now, Scott, if you ever encounter a demon, just rebuke them in the name of Jesus and they have to flee. <laughs> so that was the extent of my training. So I implemented it, man. That's all I knew, man. You implement what you know. You implement what you know. That's all I knew. So I just, I tried to lay hands on it and just aggressively, man, the script was like, I'm going to tear your hand off. Man. Listen, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. And it did not work. <laughs> it did not work. It only agitated those demons. Man, I mean, it's like, boom, one of those, and but he's six foot four and completely gets up there, grabs a row of chairs with superhuman strength. And I'll tell you, the six people who were left in the room will testify to this. Because the others would run out of the exit as quick as they could. With superhuman strength, he just grab that row of chairs and just toss them. Goes storming up, gets behind this 200-pound oak roster, and just starts picking it up. Boom, boom, boom. And just rocking it. Just taunting and mocking. Just speaking blasphemies, foaming at the mouth, challenging what you do? Everyone's looking to me. Hey, you're the missionary. You're the man of God. You're the one who's supposed to deal with this stuff. You're the one. Now, let me tell you what. I didn't get too close. I was about from that road here to it. Because you couldn't get there in those spirits of violence. My knees were trembling. I had total cotton mouth. Because I didn't know what to do. I didn't what to do. And this is what we're wanting to remedy in Kayaki. That you understand what it is to be men and women of the Spirit. You understand what it is to walk in kingdom authority. <laughs> Nobody had taught that to me. Oh, I could preach a nice little sermon. Well, I knew my introduction, my transitions. I knew my homiletics. But I didn't know how to I was sitting there shaking cotton mouth. Holy Spirit speaks to me and says, Scott, my angels are encompassed about me. Call them in the service right now. Oh, did I hear that right? I mean, are you serious? I mean, you know, and what do you do? I have nothing to lose now, okay? You're either going to step out in bold faith, in kingdom faith, or you're going to get your bootay kicked. But you're going to get skeeved, okay? And by faith, feeling nothing except intrepidation. By faith, let me tell you something. There's time to deal with stuff, and you're going to be spooked. You may even be scared. That does not mean that you do not have faith. That does not mean that you do not have faith. I defy that. Man, you can be spooked. You can be startled. You might even be scared, but that does not mean that you're faithless. And I stood my ground, and I spoke the word that the Lord said. In Jesus' name, angels of the living God, would you bind his hands and feet right now? And by faith, I spoke that. And all of a sudden, he whipped around that washer. I mean, he literally spun around like that. Got right in front, and look, look, I got a WWF. Boom! Boom! I mean... He falls flat on his back, his arms pinioned to the ground, his feet stick down like that. Now, if, if I hold my, my 
wrists, my fingers on my wrists right now, and I take them off, you can see my fingerprints here. You can still see those where they were. You can see these massive handprints on his wrist. You can see them on his wrist, like they're both of them. Yeah, I was like, well, this might be easier than I thought. <laughs> so, I mean, I have this angelic intervention, and friends, let me tell you, angels I'm on the sacred mention 238 times in the scripture. And they are very, very real. And I've had angelic intervention more than once in, in, in times that I've been in some critical situations. So I went down to try to cast them out, which I did not know what to do. You know, was there some magical formula to speak over them? You know, bring the oil, you know, lay the Bible on their head. I, so I, uh, I went to lay hands on them. He lifted up his head. I am literally trying to bite him. I, I was like, can you get his head too? <laughs> no exaggeration, man. His head goes down. I am not exaggerating. I'm, I'm downplaying the way this lady comes down. I'm downplaying. Dumped for four hours, I got a clinic on the kingdom of God. I didn't just get a clinic on deliverance. I got, I got a clinic on the kingdom of God and the efficacy of the spirit of God. I got a clinic on what it meant to operate in the kingdom authority. Kingdom authority acting in the fullness of biblical and Holy Spirit provision. Right? Christ sends you forth as his disciples to walk in kingdom authority. Now, people get kingdom authority and spiritual authority confused, but they are not the same thing. We'll talk about that in just a minute. But that was the thing that would begin to open me up. I want to talk about the four quadrants of kingdom authority. Um, we're going to go to the four areas. The first is moral authority. The second is biblical authority. The third is delegated authority and spiritual authority. Now, I unpack these in the book. Um, it would take a good three hours for me to unpack these in, in, in detail with you. So I'm just going to quickly give you a cursory view of this. The first is moral authority. Moral authority defined as acting in the fullness of a holy, non-compromised life. Listen to this. Moral authority acting in the fullness of a holy, non-compromised life. In other words, let me say this. You do not walk in kingdom authority unless all four of these quadrants are in operation at the same time in your life. Do you understand what I'm saying? So you can say, you can have moral authority, you can have biblical authority, you can have delegate authority, but if you don't have spiritual authority, you'll never walk in kingdom authority. You can have spiritual authority, biblical authority, preach your word, you can have delegate authority, but if you don't have moral authority, you will never walk in the fullness of the kingdom. You will not walk in kingdom authority. So kingdom authority operating in your life or mine is predicated upon us walking in all four of those quadrants, more biblical, delegated, and spiritual. Okay? So moral authority, acting in the fullness of a holy, non-compromised life. This is why sin issues doesn't mean that God can't use you. It doesn't mean that you won't be used by God. But this is why those, those little things that you think are done in secret, those little tensions that you still grapple with, those attitudes, rebellions, all those sorts of things that begin to erode your moral credibility will prevent you from walking in the kingdom. When Jesus sent his disciples out, I tell you, and the book will begin to unfold this biblically, you'll see them operating in all four quadrants. Thus, they were able to operate in the full kingdom of the world. So I'm, I'm telling you right now, moral authority is critical. Doug Clay talked about in the 1980s how these summons of God. Jimmy Spider was one of them. Man, that, that man operated in such a remarkable, remarkable. Well, I talked to, I think the guys were talking to me, said, he walked in a remarkable ministry and preached the word of God. He he had an incredible spiritual authority. He was delegated by the sons of God. But he lacked moral authority. And it was that that would cause everything to crumble. He never walked in the fullness of kingdom authority. Friends, 
There's some people who have passed through the very gates that you're going through right now, are you right? They sat in the same seats you were sitting in. They had, they understood the Spirit. They were filled with the Spirit. They could speak in tongues, go pray for somebody, blah, 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 whatever it is. Man, they could preach an incredible message. Man, they could do a much better job than I'm doing today. They could articulate and unfold and just preach this incredible message. And it would be true. They were had the stamp of, of kind of, man, got to the internship, get the gold stamp on the letter. And man, you're, you're now good to go. They got their credentials with the assemblies of God. But when they got on campus, their moral authority lacked, and it was what would eventually cause their demise. We had one person, Hale the Kayak, a pioneer, who literally started grooming young women interns. The first intern came to the spiritual authorities, the delegated authorities, and said, Hey, I'm telling you, there's something wrong. And this person, you know, you're misreading the cues. That's not what that is at all. That's not what that's not what that's not what that's not. No, I'm telling you it is. Well guess what? Eventually that person ended up having sex with students and other things. What do you think that did for the ministry? What do you think that did for Chi Alpha? What do you think that did for his life, for his wife? Moral authority is critical to walking in kingdom authority. Guard yourself. Moral authority, acting the fullness of holy, not compromised life. I'm going to set up something with one more story. And then I'm going to dissect these other things. So I have a, a friend who was a professor at uh, Missouri State University. I'm going to tell you they're a professor at Missouri State University. And a uh, very loved professor. You know, they were the, he was the advisor for the young Republicans and the conservatives and a board member of the church, board member of, of local Chi Alpha. You know, just, just really a this stellar citizen, you know, who had their opinions and they would vocalize them. Well, one day it came out that he had been having affairs with students and parents. So it gets to the church. He's a board member of the church. All kinds of stuff. It gets to the church. And for some reason, the church comes to me and says, hey, Scott, would, would you be willing to deal with this for us? Why am I, why am I dealing with this? You know, I'm, not, I'm not on the board. I'm not, you know, I'm not here much. No, no, we're asking you to deal with this. So this guy was a friend, a personal friend whose moral authority had completely collapsed. Had all kinds of platforms, incredible speaker, okay, all, but moral authority collapsed. So, sit him down and just began to, to address things with him. Right? Like, hey, you know, you've really, really botched it. You're not a church. You're not doing anything. You're stepping off the board. You're not doing the church. So go through the whole, whole pattern of this person said, going to have to step off. I want you to step off the board with Chi Alpha, the whole bit, and then later maybe you can come on. And then the church, you know, when it's time for you to come back on, you can come back on. So he stepped away for about two years. And after two years, he and his wife uh, ended up, the church started start teaching Sunday school again. And because I really put some really hard core stuff there, we came into class, I don't think you're saved. And he said, don't, don't do that. I don't think you're saved. I'm not sure you really know Jesus. He came to use an MP came. Pastor's kid. I said, oh, no, no. I said, no, you just need to get your life right with God. So anyway, two years goes by, and now they're back teaching Sunday school. Okay. They want to go to biblical authority. That's moral authority. Biblical authority. You gotta go quick. Biblical authority, acting the fullness of the provision of God's word. I want to suggest something to you. This word here is powerful, man. There is power. In the words of Jesus, nothing is more powerful than this book. There is nothing more powerful than the words of Christ. Nothing has ever been spoken is more powerful than that. There is authority in the words of Jesus, okay? It may not be authority to it always, but there is in the words of Jesus. And so when we go back to Matthew 28, and Jesus said, All authority in heaven and earth is being 
Timothy to be there for make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything, all that I've commanded you. Teaching them what? Teaching them to do what? Observe all. All that I have commanded you. In other words, when Jesus was sending his people out, he was sending his disciples out with this mandate. Hey, when you make disciples, you walk in biblical authority, you teach them everything, all pots, everything that I have commanded you. That means the hard stuff as well. Today, there are certain things that we avoid because if you talk about it, you're going to get canceled. If you talk about it, you're going to offend somebody. Well, I can tell you what, when you go through the whole gospel, it's offensive to people. And let me tell you, if you're living in things that are completely objectionary to what the scripture says, it will be offensive. But Jesus said, as you make disciples, my commission to you is that you teach them all that I have commanded you. Homosexuality is sin. Same-sex attraction isn't. Homosexuality is sin. The practice of homosexuality is sin. Lust, acting on sin. Lust, sin. There are certain things that we have an obligation to teach that come from the Word. You teach all of them, but if you do, you hold the risk of being canceled. Well, I got news for you. Jesus got canceled. They canceled Jesus. They canceled Peter. They canceled Paul. They canceled all those voices. Now, I'm not saying you've got to do stupid stuff. But I'm saying that you have an obligation to build up and make disciples and make disciples who understand all the words of Jesus, even when it is uncomfortable. You cannot skirt the truth of the gospel. Acting in biblical authority. Biblical authority also means you do what the Bible says. Biblical authority means you do what the Bible says. You teach all and you do and practice what it says. So this professor, two years goes by, back teaching Sunday school, back in quiet. Let me just make one or six point of this. Luke chapter 4 is when Jesus encounters Satan. You know the Satan comes in Luke chapter 4, listen. And Jesus, full, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit. If you want to be led by the Spirit, you need to be full of the Spirit. He was led by the Spirit in the wilderness 40 days and being tempted of the devil. He ate nothing during those days. And when they were ended, he was hungry. The devil said to him, Did the Son of God command these stones to become bread? Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone. And the devil took him up and showed him all the kings of the world in a moment's time. All the kingdoms of pots, everything that was, is, and is to come. All the kingdoms of the world in the moment's time. Don't think the devil doesn't have some mojo for him. For him to take Jesus up to this pinnacle and show him everything, everything that was, is, and is to come, he got a little mojo moving there. All the kingdoms of the time, and he said, To you I'll give all this glory, all this authority. It has been delivered to me, and to him of I will. If you worship me, it is all yours. Listen, Jesus didn't push back and say, God, you big lie. God, you don't have that authority. That's the authority of my God. No, no. He didn't say that. And Jesus answered him. How does Jesus answer him? It is written, you should worship the Lord your God, and him only shall be served. And he took him into Jerusalem, set him on the pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, If you're the Son of God, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you to guard you. And in their hands, they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against the stone. And Jesus answered him, It is said, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Listen to this. Satan goes and connects with Jesus. This is not the first time that he's connected with Jesus. Satan's known him for million, billion, trillion years. Just, Oh my God! Oh, oh, he finally came! No! He's known this is a familial conversation, friends. This is literally in a familial conversation. It's not like Jesus is startled by Satan popping up. He knew him. He knew him in heaven. This isn't anything, oh boy. But listen to how this conversation goes. Satan makes a temptation. How does Jesus respond? Biblical authority. It is written. 
Satan makes another temptation. Jesus operates in biblical authority. It is written. Then Satan operates in biblical authority. Oh, it's written. It's written. And he quotes scripture accurately to Jesus. I'll tell you something. Biblical authority is power. Getting back to the professor. Two years, all of a sudden, another call committed adultery. Stupid. Scott, when you deal with this, I told the board if I deal with it, you need to delegate authority to me. You need to give me delegate authority to cooperate. Whatever I say, you do. They delegated authority to me. I sat this guy down and said, you know what? You're a pervert. You are a pervert. I said, I think you're going to hell. I, I mean, I really, I wanted to dangle him over the place. I said, you're a pervert. I think you're going to hell. You do not know Christ. You do not know Christ. No, don't, he's balling. I don't stop him. Stop all that. I mean, just, oh my gosh, you're so cruel. No, I knew what it's going to take for protection. It's called biblical authority. So you go the whole thing. You're, you're going to step off of all the boards and you're going to tell me because you're more than just small fight. So you're going to go The last thing I said is, you, second line, I said, you will never, you'll never step a foot on a platform again in church. I said, you just get that out of your head. That's over for you. Unless someday they come in, you never ask, you never talk, you're done. Don't want you to ever even approach that. You're just going to be lucky. And I said, by the way, if you try to go to another church, I'm going to go to the pastor, and I'm going to tell them why you left. I'm going to hold you accountable. And I said, here's the last thing. Two weeks from now, you're going to get up before the whole church, and you're going to confess your fault before the whole church. And you're going to ask them, God, <gasps> man of great pride, <gasps> you'll do it or you're out. So you're not a church, you're out of camp. Biblical authority. We yeah, had some missionary friends saying with us this weekend, two weeks ago. Uh, I want to say, you know, uh, something unique is going to happen in church today. It's not normal, but you know, uh, this is not a normal thing, but I'm just warning you. So, Sunday morning content. It's regular Sunday morning. So the church the building was about 500. It was packed to capacity. Nobody knew anything. I'm in the balcony, everything. So I meet him out in the foyer. And out in the foyer, he comes up and, and he lost like 25 pounds of food. Ashley Gray, his wife, crying. She runs up to him. Scott, I'm begging you. Please don't make him do this. I'm begging you. Please, if he's going to kill it, please, I'm begging you. And I almost gave him. I was that close to giving him. And Paul Spirit says, don't you. You stay. I almost came to him in the name of compassion. You want to operate in compassion? You operate in biblical authority. You teach them everything. And you do everything the Bible says. The Bible talks about how you handle this thing. He said, no, he will do it. And he'll do it today. And if he dies, he dies. And I wasn't joking. I mean, I, it could have killed him. He does, he does. Be a great testament to the church. <laughs> Acts chapter 5, baby. Acts chapter 5. Biblical authority. Acts chapter 5. Time to get the preacher preaching one of those masterful sermons ever in the It's incredible. He gets up after that. And, uh, and he goes, now, Dr. So-and-so and his wife have something like to share with him. Okay, we have a bonfire in the house or some party. Go all the time. Gets up, and he just does, just, I mean, plays the role perfectly. I mean, confesses his sin. There's a whole thing like that. And everyone's like, oh. And then after his pastor goes, now, Dr. So-and-so ought to be standing right down here. And if you have anything like to say to him in the service, you're welcome to come and share with him. So they're down there. But then he says this. He said, and I also just say, if any of you are harboring any sin, is there any stuff that you think you're hiding from God? Then I'd suggest you get it right before the Lord. Whoa, man! I mean, I've never seen such an awful call in my life in that church, boy. I mean, people throw it up, you think things by the scripts they can do. I why? Because they saw them in the book. They, so, let me tell you what, when you're tied off with see true biblical authority in action, it will begin to change things. Biblical authority, acting in fullness in the provision of God's word. God's just telling us. Delegated authority. Delegated authority. 
acting in the fullness of rights that have been directly given. Acting in the fullness of rights that have been directly given. In other words, this. If you're going to be in authority, you need to be under authority as well. People who want some independent spirit. You're not going to tell me what to do. You're not going to tell me what to teach. You're not going to tell me. You're not going to tell me. You're not going to tell me. They never walk in the fullness of kingdom authority because they're not under delegated authority. Delegated authority means you are submitted. That there's a point in your life that you are submitted to those authorities. Okay. Each year, or when you guys affiliate, have they been affiliated yet? Okay, how many of you guys got a letter from me when you affiliated? Oh, they haven't yet. So many. Okay, when did you get a letter from me? A little cold start. Man, you're now affiliated. You have all the rights and privileges to use the name Chi Alpha to be a Chi Alpha missionary. Okay, when you get credentialed with the sons of God, you're putting yourself under submission. You have the rights and privileges, okay, of being a minister. The state then delegates authority to you, where you can do marriages and those sorts of things. That is delegated authority. Jesus, when he sent his disciples out, he delegated them with authority. You go with my authority. All authority I've earned has been given me. Therefore, you go and make disciples. Teaching them to do everything I've, I've told you and shown you. Right? But it was delegated. So if you have delegated authority, which means that you have, there's a level of submission to Chi Alpha and to those in authority. When people walk out of delegated authority, it is one of the first red flags that he says, they are due to collapse. And you will never walk in the fullness of the kingdom. I have watched people who got mad at Chi Alpha, who got mad at some guy, whatever, and they have left it. And they've left it, right? Because they got offended, they got mad, they would not submit themselves to authority. And they are a shell, just a shell of what they once were. Delegated authority is critical, is important, and those who are, we are submitted to, we need to select wisely. So that's how we get off on dogma. That's how we get off on bad theology. All that stuff. That's how we start going off rails when we step out from under a delegated authority. Last thing it says I could share with you now on spiritual authority. Um, spiritual authority. Acting in the fullness of the power, gifts, and impartation of Holy Spirit. Now, people oftentimes confuse kingdom authority with spiritual authority. But they are not the same thing. Right? Kingdom authority, spiritual authority. Kingdom authority is a composite of all four of these. There's lots of spiritual authorities today. You guys ever heard of um, a witch doctor? No? No. I mean, if you get around, you start getting around to some of the native red witch doctors, witches, shamans. There's lots of spiritual authority. There's the mind of principalities. Well, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against spirit, principalities, and rulers of darkness and spiritual wickedness in this age. Our fight is not against flesh and blood. Do not go on your campus and think that you're having some mental, intellectual, just battle with people. It's always a spiritual battle. And if you don't go, you got to engage your mind, but don't go into the spirit realm. A person's never born again because the mind is not born again. You renew the mind. Now, we know your mind isn't born again because there's all kinds of nasty little thoughts in this room today. Unforgiveness, bitterness, resentment, all sorts of things that we still lust, things that we're grappling with. But the spirit man, that's where we're part of. That's the ultimate culmination. That's where it's born again, the spirit. You have to walk in biblical, moral, delegated, and spiritual authority. Second Corinthians, Paul says this, though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty through God to the tearing down of strongholds, casting down imagination, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing to captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Friends, there's a spiritual battle, and this is why the fact of the Holy Spirit, this is why you being full of the Holy Spirit is so critical to you watching the fullness of kingdom authority. Now, I'm out of time. I, I, I don't have time to begin to unpack this. When you get the book, you can read some more. My second book, all of which is just on spiritual authority. Well, I want to say this. When we were at the University of Arizona, and there was a semester that went by that we didn't end up seeing students set free of demonic powers. Oh, wow. That, no, that's not, that's not exceptional. That's more than it. Right. 
Do you think on your campus you have this coming out of form bound? I'm gonna tell you what, the discipleship's gonna lead in him, but I'm telling you at times, the man it was a prayer and the authority of the kingdom. I could I could tell you some real funny stories that I'm gonna tell you some great testimony that can happen public on campus with students being set free of course of the darkness. Spiritual authority. Christ has called you to walk in the fullness of kingdom authority. Moral authority, biblical authority, delegated authority, and spiritual authority. And that's why Holy Spirit power is the fourth, is the third quadrant of healthy Chi Alpha. So we want every single one of you to be able to walk in the fullness of the kingdom, walk in all four of those quadrants, so we can see true kingdom authority. I end with this in the last minute. We see very little kingdom authority. We see very little kingdom authority church today. see very little kingdom authority in Chi Alpha today. Very sporadic. We see some spiritual authority. We see some doubt. We see some of these quadrants in operation. But I'm telling you, we see very little spiritual authority. And if we're going to steward the greatest awakening of, of university students the world has ever seen, it's going to be, going to be because there's a generation of young men and women who stepped up as missionaries who understand kingdom authority. And they know how to walk through it. Hey,